Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Michael Thomas. I'm the Director of Technology here at Key Code Media. And we're uh, thrilled to welcome you to our uh, Avid Interplay Sphere demo today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how the Avid Interplay Sphere can help immensely in the educational realm. We're going to go over the interface. We're going to go over some of the uh, topologies. And we're also going to discuss um, how exactly this can aid your scholastic institution. We're also going to have a special guest, Matt Straub. Matt Straub is with Clark Magnet High School. Uh, and he'll be able to discuss um, how they were able to get funding, how they've structured their curriculum, which makes them one of the leaders here in Southern California uh, in terms of video curriculums. Uh, with me today uh, is Scott Williams, who's our technical manager and ACSR elite here at Key Code Media. Uh, Scott, if, uh, if there's anything AVID, if there's anything Interplay, Scott is uh, the de facto standard. There is no one better uh, in the world than Scott Williams. Uh, and of course, Matt Straub, uh, as mentioned, from Clark Magnet High School, will also be with us uh, talking about financing uh, as well as their video program. Before we dive into the nitty gritty of the tech, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what Avid Interplay is. So as we go through the demo, uh, you know exactly what we're looking at and what Scott's going to be showing. So Avid Interplay consists of three main components. Uh, the heart and soul, the brain of Avid Interplay is called Interplay Production. Interplay Production are the uh, several servers, the hardware and software that make all of the sharing and simultaneous editing work. Uh, this includes uh, uh, some servers as well as storage, which is built on an ISIS 5000 system. Uh, the Interplay Production allows for different roles uh, for different uh, people inside the production, whether they be editors, whether they be producers, whether they be directors to have access uh, and kick off workflows uh, that will uh, manipulate the media that they've added to the project. On top of that is Interplay Central. Interplay Central is a web-based uh, GUI that allows you to manipulate media and these roles, uh, whether it be uh, setting acquisition, whether it be logging footage, uh, basic story editing and transcoding. Uh, this is what allows you to access basic functionality and collaboration features uh, remotely through a, a more familiar web interface. The part that is really cool and the part that the students are going to be able to use uh, is the Interplay Sphere. Uh, Interplay Sphere uh, is an option for Interplay production, and this allows your uh, predators, your editors in the field, your producers to acquire, um, access workgroup assets, share, edit, upload uh, in real time. And this is, can be done remotely, so you're not tethered to a computer lab, you're not tethered to uh, a small set of computers. This can be done anywhere in the world, from across town, to a coffee shop, to a different time zone. And this is what really brings the whole concept of simultaneous collaboration uh, together. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, here's another scenario. You can imagine the students being out in the field shooting P2 XD cam, uh, use their GoPros, use their Blackmagic Cinema cameras. Uh, they can use a what we call a thin client, which would be a, a low-powered uh, laptop instead of carrying around a bulky workstation. Uh, get that footage into the computer, uh, start working with it, and at the same time, push it back to the Interplay production server uh, so everyone has access to it. So again, you're not tethered to this lab, uh, uh, which can be uh, costly uh, as well. So uh, you may be thinking, well, this is great for post-production workflows, but how would this benefit education? Uh, and that's very important, and, and that's, again, the main reason we're here today. Um, for several different reasons. Uh, first off, it helps reduce lab and facility operational costs. You can imagine the time and money spent um, having someone who's technical, someone who understands how to edit, um, be available for students uh, in off hours, whether it be early morning, whether it be uh, afternoon, late evening, whether it be on the weekends. Trying to staff that can be very cost prohibitive. Uh, so to have the access to work on this media um, uh, remotely at any hours of the day without having access to the lab um, is a drastic cost savings. This also allows faculty to review and approve projects from their home, so they're not taking up valuable lab time going over uh, all of this media. 
It also allows a student to student collaboration without limitations uh, of schedules. Uh, there are growing pressures today for students to have extracurricular activities, uh, whether they have jobs or multiple jobs, whether there's family commitments. Um, being able to have students work at their own pace, uh, work with, uh, work and collaborate with other students at off hours is immensely powerful and can really help uh, sort out these finite number of hours in a day. We know that in schools, we're obviously teaching more and more media-centric classes. It's less book and more technology-driven. Because of that, uh, these school labs are being tied up with all these various classes, and there just aren't enough computers to go around. So being able to repurpose these labs to, uh, to be used for these other media-centric classes or media uh, technology-based classes and let the students work on these uh, very lab-intensive products or projects outside of the four walls of the school um, drastically reduces costs for building more labs or upkeeping these expensive machines. Many students have laptops today. Um, it just makes it easier, easier for them to do their homework or, or even schoolwork uh, in class or remotely. So being able to have uh, students use a laptop, a less expensive laptop, to work on these projects remotely uh, drastically uh, reduces the cost involved of, of schools buying this technology and students having to buy their own laptops. But more importantly, uh, one of our main jobs is to make sure that students know what's going on in the real world, to prepare them for what's happening uh, out there when they get a job in the media space. And so it, it, that behooves us to uh, show them what's going on and, and keep them up to date with what's out there uh, by uh, putting an interplay system um, inside your, uh, your four walls, you are now grooming them to be using technology that is uh, becoming uh, a large part of the post-production realm. Uh, it gets them up to speed so when they do hit the real world, when they do hit the job market, they have the skills, uh, not just in, in craft editing, but also in technology, to be able to hit the ground running. So while Scott Williams goes over uh, uh, the, the demo today, there's a couple things I'd like you to keep in mind. Uh, first off, how do you get material from outside of the classroom into the classroom? Is this currently a bottleneck for you? Uh, students bringing in hard drives, students bringing in uh, cards with media, students bringing in, uh, you know, getting media from FTP sites. Is that a bottleneck? Would the ability to upload this footage remotely from anywhere, would that alleviate bottlenecks in your schedule in terms of time and equipment? Uh, how are your students currently accessing digital media uh, from the school when they're not in class? Um, are they having to transport it on expensive drives? Are the drives breaking? Are the drives getting lost or stolen? Um, do they have to download media again from an FTP site? Is that a bottleneck? If you had the ability to get media from the central location, from the lab, uh, from the school, to edit with remotely, how is that being done and is that a bottleneck right now? Uh, are you finding that editors, producers, directors, that they're islands? As we know, whenever you're constructing a media-based project, um, you can't be an island. It takes a village. And if you're finding editors and producers aren't working together because of schedules, because of limitations of technology and distance, would being able to bridge that gap to have a unified place that the media can be accessed, um, would that streamline things? Would that be beneficial to your students uh, to uh, create and lastly, uh, as we mentioned, are there not enough commuter systems to go around? Um, the, whenever you're editing media, working with media, it becomes very time intensive. The creation process is not easy. So being able to ration out time on all these computers for these storytelling classes, for these technology classes, um, would the ability of being able to do this remotely and not tying up your, your labs, would that be a benefit? So these are some things I'd like, like you to keep uh, in mind as we go through uh, the webinar today. So, uh, you've heard enough about me. Uh, I'm going to throw this over to Scott Williams, who, as I mentioned, uh, is our interplay guru here at Keycode Media. And he's going to go over the interface and some finer points of uh, Avid Interplay and Avid Interplay Sphere. So, without any further ado, let me toss it over to Scott. Uh, so, Scott, give us some interplay. Good morning, educators. My name is Scott Williams. I'm a technical manager here at Keycode Media. Uh, former Avid, spent a few years putting uh, interplays uh, across the globe. And now I'm going to show you a little bit about the new toy that Avid has released. 
If you're looking at your screen right now, you'll see uh, a bit of a diagram. This is the physical uh, makeup of a, of a smaller interplace system. All you really need to get uh, central and sphere going. Uh, you'll notice that there's an interplay production engine here, uh, the interplay central server, uh, an ISIS, uh, two chassis ISIS, switch, some editors, little archive down here. Uh, basically, all you really need for this system is the interplay central server and the interplay production engine. Uh, what this does is the interplay production engine is your database. Uh, it also indexes your media on the ISIS. And the interplay central server is connected to the switch and it mounts ISIS and shares out the media that's on the, on the central system. So now we're going to dive right into the database using a product called Access. Uh, Avid Interplay Access is pretty much the primary uh, media manager and administrator tool. It's a thin client, uh, it's software that can be loaded on, on most uh, software platforms, you know, uh, Windows 7 uh, and Mac OS. It is a window into the database. It allows you to place all the media in a uh, folder structure that's easily searchable, including a search engine built into the system. So any kind of uh, metadata that the, the clips are tagged with, whether it be a sequence, master clip, um, any kind of asset really, uh, any kind of metadata that, uh, that clip is tagged with, you can use this robust search engine to find it. See here, different categories, modified dates, uh, whether it's in use, whether it's video, what, kind, what type it is, what resolution. You'll be able to search through the entire database uh, to find these different clips. And this, of course, search engine is uh, across the board with all of the different uh, client attachments to Interplay, whether it be you know, this access or Media Composer or Sphere or Central. So we're going to go over here uh, to our folder structure. This is the default folder structure that comes with uh, the Interplay database, and you can change it, modify it to your own whim. Uh, right here, we're using a folder called Incoming Media, and that's where I've placed all of my raw media. So any uh, media that's come into the system, uh, I'll tag it into this folder so that it's easier for the editors uh, to find. And then down here is the Projects folder. Now this folder contains all the projects that are going on in the Interplay system. I've created a Sphere WebEx for today's WebEx. And I've got two folders here, uh, one Sphere WebEx bin and then the Sphere WebEx Office Chase, which is another bin. So if I opened up that in Media Composer, they would appear as bins. And basically, you know, this organizes all the clips and whatnot that I have in these particular projects. And with that, we are going to launch Interplay Central. So Interplay Central is the newest toy from Avid. It is a web-based editing platform. It can be opened in Google Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer with the Google Chrome plugin, or Safari. So it's usable on most OS platforms. And here it is. The screen is uh, completely configurable. Right here I've set up a, uh, a pretty easy editing palette. Uh, allows me to see all of, you know, allows me to see the uh, folder structure where all of my clips are uh, and sequences. It gives me a, a window to view clips. It gives me audio meters to check audio. Uh, the search engine, like I discussed earlier. Uh, a sequence window for my timelines and then markers for any kind of locators that I decide to add. Because this, you know, this is a great uh, uh, tool for, I mean, especially with students, you'd be able to work on projects outside of the edit bay. Because with, you know, Central and Sphere, it really does take a lot of the work out of the edit bay. So the edit bay can be used primarily what it's supposed to be used for, which is finishing, editing a final product. Using Central and Sphere, of course, you can go home and do homework. Uh, you can prep your clips, you can prep your, your bins for the next day when you have to be in the edit bay and you only have a short amount of time in there, say like you know, two or three hours to get your, your, uh, you know, your project done. So let's open up the project that I'm working on. I'm working on two different clips here. I've got 
one where I'm going to show you guys exactly how the in and out of Interplay works, and then one project that I've already completed called the Office Chase. And here's my sequence. So this is a sequence that I already put together. Uh, you'll notice that I've got full video on the sequence. Everything's playing there in, the, uh, in that left-hand window. Now what that is, that is an H.264 file that is be being created on the fly by the Interplay Central server. And what it's doing is the server is slicing out pieces of video and sending it directly to the web GUI, which, you know, this video is cached locally in the server, uh, and then handing it out to the, to the web page. And a cool aspect of Central is uh, one of the security features. The central server, you know, basically resides on your house network. It doesn't have a pipe out uh, to the rest of the world. What you would have to do is you would hand uh, the person logging into the system VPN access. And VPN access, you know, it's, uh, you know, part of your corporate network or your house network. And, you know, once you get that, you're on the network and you would open up the web GUI and log into the central server. So not any person, you know, randomly can get into your system and look at your media. Uh, you actually have to have um, a, a permission using this VPN uh, gateway into the facility. So here we are. We're looking at the video. It's, you know, it's some compelling stuff. <laughs> um, and here I've got uh, my first locator. So let's let's add some locators right here. We're gonna hit play. The guy is scared in front of a bathroom, and let's add one in. Scared in front. Of bathroom. All right, save. And I'm going to go back to access, which was the thin client also that's used in the system. I'll go to my office chase and we scroll down and scared in front of bathroom. There it is. So we've got the, the locator that I just uh, added to the system. So what that marker does is that goes across everything. So this, this locator will appear in Media Composer, it'll appear in Central, it'll appear in Access. Uh, now that uh, piece is tagged with this information. So you'll be able to make all these markers and all of these uh, locator files with timecode and different colored uh, uh, pegs to set up your, your sequence and all of your clips before you get into the edit bay. It's a wonderful feature and it takes a lot of time out of, out of having to well, it, what it does is it, it doesn't burn up as much time in the edit bay. All right, got that going. So with that in mind, uh, let's search for another clip here. Um, we're going to use the search engine. I've put in bathroom here. And now it's going to go through and find all of my clips in the database that have bathroom in it. So here we are, bathroom door. I can click on it. It opens up in my GUI. Set. And I can mm -hmm. review it. And I can also tag it. Guy install. And now guy install is part of that clip. So you can use, use it with master clips or sequences. Now we are going to bring up Media Composer. So Media Composer, obviously, is a tool that is widely used across the business. And hopefully most of you guys know exactly the, how, to, how to use the, the product. I'm going to open up. And this is the new window here. It's an Interplay login. And the only difference between this being a Media Composer and this being a Sphere client is this checkbox right here, where it says Remote Client. If I uncheck the box, it would be a normal Media Composer, and I would use ISIS, which if you check down here in the bottom right, you'll notice that there is no ISIS client. There is nothing mounted. I don't have any drives mounted. So I'm going to click on Remote Client and log in. It's getting me into the database. It is asking me which folder in the folder structure that I want to check into. And I've been using the project's Sphere WebEx folder location. Click on that. And now I am ready to open up my project and start a new bin for this new project. And if you look down here, you'll see uh, Sphere WebEx Office Chase. That was the sequence that we just opened in Central. Now I'm going to create a new sequence uh, to use remotely. 
sequence. Test WebEx. Wonderful. Now let's grab some video and pull it in. And like I said, this is a remote client, so we are going to show you how that looks. Let's pull up some video here. All right, we've got a couple clips here. Men's room, uh, looks like scene 20, take five, bathroom. So we're going to grab those couple clips and bring it into the system. And you'll notice that there's arrows, which means that they are downloaded clips from uh, the main system to your remote location. So I'm going to click on that, hit play, and here we go. It's playing. In fact, one of these clips has that locator, uh, bathroom door. So I made some, I made some uh, markers earlier in the day. And we are playing this remotely. This is a, 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 a cached H.264 file. And the difference between Central and Sphere is that with Sphere, you, you're using a more robust editor. You're probably using a laptop with a uh, significant processor and, and a larger hard drive. So it will actually cache the clips locally. So that if you're, if you're editing and you have an interrupt in um, you know, wireless or internet or of any kind, uh, it's cached locally so you won't have to have a hiccup. So we're going to grab that clip and drop it in and grab one of these other scenes here and add that in. Oops. Let's see, there we go. Drop that on there. And uh, one more. Let's do... There we go. Scene 20, take four. We'll put that guy in there too. There we go. So now I've got three clips in my awesome sequence. It's a, it's a compelling MC story about the bathroom. Marker. Let's give it a second to catch up. There we go. So what that did is it, it now cached all the clips that I had in my, my bin locally. Marker. And they are all Sound playing speed. out. Speed. Fantastic. I'm going to update Interplay, let it know that I want it to start tracking uh, all of this information. We go to Central, we can actually bring that up. So let's go back here, let's go back to the other WebEx uh, folder that I had open, and here it is, Test WebEx. And here's the sequence that I just built in Sphere. So. This web GUI is attached to the home system uh, via wireless, and then I'm using Sphere uh, via wireless to uh, look at the same clips that are back on the, uh, the system in a different location. And the really next cool feature of Sphere is local import and upload to the home system. So let's grab a clip here. Uh, something, something not too big. I think this guy's good. Yep, we'll open him up. XDCAM HD. So this clip is living on, the, on my local C drive of my, my laptop. So I'm going to import it into my bin and add it into my timeline. And now it doesn't exist back on the system in, uh, where, well, where the main, the main um, uh, service system is. So I'm going to upload it. I'm going to upload a, a, a low res copy first and then a high res copy so that anyone back at the facility can see the low-res copy while the high-res copy is making its trip. And if you look up, there's no arrow on this one. It's because it's a, lo it's a local media. So first things first, I am going to check this bin into Interplay to let it know I want it to track it. And then I am going to remote upload it. Proxy then high. I'm going to turn it into an XDCAM 50 because that's what I've been operating in. And you'll see this little green circle here. I'm going to open that up. And that is the clip 06 uh, being uploaded in the background. Well, it looks like I already finished. Wonderful. Actually, let's, let's pull in another one. Let's get two clips in here. I think that one already b lives on the system. Let's see, 422. And this one does not. Let's do that one. So we're going to import this guy. Probably take a little bit longer because it's twice the size. <coughs> In the meantime, since the system was checked in, we're going to run back here and take a look at 
see if that other clip made it. Oh, and there it is. There's the um, 106 file. Uh, the light went from yellow to green to let us know that it had finished making the, the trip back to the system. Okay, we'll get back to about halfway there. We'll let that keep going. And we'll open up that same clip in, uh, in the central client. Around here, see the project that we were working on. And there it is. And what this do is doing right now is it's loading it into the ICS server. Uh, when the video appears, we'll be able to play it because it's doing a on-the-fly transcode. And there it is. So that was pretty quick for a round trip. And let's see if our other file is completed yet. Nice. Good timing. So now that clip is completed, we're going to open that up. It's 104. Hit play. So this is the high-risk copy that's living on the C drive. We're just going to do another uh, round trip. And we will check this bin into Interplay. It's checked in now. We're going to add this clip to our timeline. And we are going to upload it back to the home base. And there it is in the background. Actually, let's get rid of these old uploads. Clear and active jobs. Ah, we'll just let that upload in the background. Let's see, remote sync progress. So that's going to keep going. And that green circle will keep chugging away. And if we go to my bin over here in Access, which I'd be using back at the home base. And I'll update that. Let's see, and there is the clip. I'll we'll go down here, and there is the clip. It's still yellow, so it's still making its trip. Up, oh, it's green, so relatively quick move. It was a, a smaller clip, and that's already back in the system. So I'm going to go here and take a look at this, and go back to central and open up that same clip. Hit refresh. And there it is. It's going to do its little flip right here. And it turned an H.264 file. So basically what happened right there was I was on a Sphere client, a remote editor, remote media composer. Uh, I had local media that I brought into the, into the, the local timeline of, of what I was working on. I checked it into Interplay. I uploaded it to the home core system, which is, you know, could be anywhere in the world. Uh, and then I used the web GUI to access that clip that I had just uploaded. And we can even open up the timeline. Get a refresh on that one. Actually, what we should do is we should update this timeline here in Media Composer. And this is my completed timeline with all the different clips. Okay, you see them? They're all playing out fine on my Sphere Editor, which is remote. Do a final check-in to Interplay. Go back here to the Interplay Central, and uh, you know what? We should refresh. And there is the rest of my sequence completed. So that is the round trip for Interplay Sphere and Central. Uh, I think I'd like to thank you guys for uh, joining us today, and uh, I'm going to throw it back to Michael. Thank you, Scott. We completely understand that just wanting the technology isn't enough. We completely understand that um, thinking, you know what, our students would love this uh, isn't enough. That's why we uh, talked to Matt Straub uh, to, to come in and talk to us about not only what they're doing at their school, but also how they went about getting the funds to revamp their video program. Uh, because as we know, uh, more than half the battle is getting the approval and getting the funding 
for it. So uh, we invited Matt in to kind of talk to us about how he did that as well as how he's running his uh, Stellar program over at Clark Magnet. And uh, I thought we'd hand it over to Matt so we can share some of his thoughts. Matt? Well, thank you everyone. I have seen the Interplace Sphere and I think for our school it would be very beneficial because of the ability to be able to access your footage remotely. You know, the thing is that we're at a high school and the students are only there for, you know, a short period of time during the day, you know, an hour and a half for one period. And the thing is, like editing, it takes a lot of a lot of work and prepping, you know, doing a lot of your rough cuts, scrubbing through your footage, and Avid Interplay is awesome for that. Clark is a technology magnet school where we focus in science and technology. Clark Magnet's cinema curriculum is developed in a way to take a student from knowing nothing to understanding the entire process of video production through the course of three years. Clark Magnet High School cinema program was set up originally with the Final Cut Studio Suite. We had gotten the program to the point where we were an Apple certified training center. Uh, I was an Apple certified trainer for Final Cut Pro. We really liked Final Cut, uh, but whenever Final Cut X came out, it didn't quite fit into where the class was going or the course was going. And uh, the direction we wanted to, to move into was network-based editing. So it had more of a uh, more of a professional working feel and the other thing along with that was that I wanted to try and maximize the time spent on a project and allow more students to work on one project in one given class so that you know the the man hours put into a project increased exponentially because of network-based editing and uh, we started with well I started with a little research so we got in touch with Avid and they sent us to Keycode where I was able to talk with some sales reps from Keycode in order to find a solution to our needs. After, uh, after meeting with Keycode and uh, talking to their sales reps about the future of the program and where we wanted to take it, then we of course came into the uh, we came into the issue of, of finding the funding because not only did we have to get a server, we also had to, to purchase computers, monitors, and uh, we were also in the process of updating our infrastructure within the whole district in terms of our network. So there was a lot going on all at once. Uh, because the class is technology-based, a lot of our funding comes through Perkins money. Um, and then there's also uh, local funding through the school and the district and there's there's various grants with which technology is funded but for the amount that we were trying to fund it, it was uh, becoming difficult to get the money to actually set up a server the way that we funded this project was through a bond measure uh, measure s and measure s was set up to provide funding for facilities in technology primarily and because my classroom was a computer lab that satisfied the technology. The board approved funding through Measure S and that became one of the Keystone Measure S projects for that year. So when you're working with, uh, with technology of course now that we're moving into the new core curriculum there's a big push for CTE in A through G and, and in all schools. A lot of that is going to be implemented through courses like video production and animation, uh, digital graphics, graphic design, photo, things like that. All of those take money. Um, one avenue is, is Perkins grant money. Uh, I would recommend that the teachers first talk to the principals. Your principals are going to be the, the people that know what monies are available and what avenues that you may have to take in order to get to the funding. Um, there's also technology grants that are being made available that you would have to do a little research with maybe through your county or technology department within, within the district. And by taking the time to look into different avenues, you can find different funding sources also for different kinds of equipment. I know that Perkins money will not fund iPads, but they'll fund computers, things like that. So 
Um, understanding how the money, how you can gain access to the money and what monies can be used for different technologies. You can sort of piecemeal your packages to figure out how to build a program. It starts with knowing what you need. And uh, the biggest thing about finding funding is that you have got to know what you need before you go looking for it. So my advice is to make sure that you sit down with technicians that can go through the process of, okay, what do we have? What do we need? And that'll give you an idea of where to start. And once you have that foundation, then you can start moving forward from there, putting together uh, a requisition or a request for specific equipment is very, very, very critical. So my advice on that is make sure you know what you need and have someone spec it out, have a technician take a look at it, make sure that that complies with your district technology as well because if you're building a course and in an infrastructure, it's gotta be cohesive with what technology you already have there. And as an educator, <laughs> you know, it's our job to be teaching future filmmakers and editors and, and lighters, and we don't always have the time to be a master of every trade, you know. And in some regards, we become very, very savvy generalists that we need to trust and depend on those people around us. Key Code Media was a fantastic component to getting me set in the right direction to know what we needed to do in order to make the project happen. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen. Thank you for being here. And back to you, Michael. Those of you uh, who have not checked out Clark Magnet, uh, please do. They have some really interesting things going on there. Uh, plus, after the webinar, uh, we'll be showing a video uh, that uh, where Matt is talking about some of the technology and you actually get to see um, uh, some of their technology in action. Um, we're going to take a few questions now. We've had a couple questions come in via email. Uh, you're also more than welcome to put them in the uh, chat window. Uh, but right now, uh, we're going to hand this off to Scott to answer a couple questions. Uh, we also have Avid in-house. So if you have any particular Avid questions, uh, we can answer those as well. So, uh, Scott, do we have some questions? Yep, I got this, uh, got this question here. What other equipment is necessary to run an Interplay system in my facility? Well, uh, Interplay... I mean, obviously, the you know the main components would be the Interplay engine and the Interplay Central engine, but you also require um, uh, some kind of switch that's qualified with Avid. Uh, requires uh, ISIS storage. Uh, it no longer works with Unity because uh, Unity, uh, of course, is end of life. Um, and plus, you know, ISIS is a uh, it's a lot more robust. It's you know Ethernet based. Um, and so yeah, so pretty much uh, a switch, an interplay engine, uh, an interplay central server, and uh, and storage, and you're good. All right. I got another question here. I got a with uh, for Avid. It's uh, Derek Evanson from Avid Technology. Hi, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, the question is: Are there per seat license fees for interplay central? And the answer is yes, there are. There's a couple of different types of license. We have base and advanced clients that attach to central and the difference is uh, what those clients can do. Base clients are primarily for logging and uh, you move to an advanced client if you need to do uh, some of the more uh, advanced editorial features and advanced sequences that you want to assemble. Now make no mistake, it's as Scott's shown, it's not the same editorial as working on Media Composer, but there are uh, some, uh, some editorial components to working in Interplay Central as an advanced client. So uh, as we wrap up the webinar, there's a couple other things that I kind of want to clue you in on. Uh, obviously, we've been talking a lot about Interplay and a lot about Sphere. However, the core of that is obviously Media Composer. Uh, Media Composer 6, 5, and 7 have um, Interplay functionality. Um, but aside from that, there are some fantastic features inside Media Composer 7 that was just released uh, not too long ago. These, in, these include things like FrameFlex, which allows you to work with material that's uh, larger than HD resolution, being able to use that inside your Media Composer product or, uh, project. Uh, we have uh, managed folders, which include background transcoding and importing, as well as consolidation. Uh, massive instant time saver for anyone uh, who works with massive amounts of media. Uh, we also have uh, 
uh, features like a decreased pricing on uh, Symphony. Uh, those of you who are doing a lot of color grade work will be thrilled uh, with the fact that Symphony is now a uh, paid option for Media Composer instead of being uh, two different products. So I highly recommend uh, you go to avid.com and download a 30-day trial to actually kick the tires on it because it, it really is phenomenal and it's uh, extraordinarily fast. Um, also, uh, those of you who are on Avid's mailing list may have seen that Avid is having a webinar uh, coming up uh, regarding audio mastering inside Media Composer uh, util utilizing the Isotope plugins. Um, I've used a lot of audio plugins in my time, whether it be Waves, whether it be uh, uh, the new uh, um, uh, ZapTec. However, Isotope is phenomenal. It should be in, in every audio person and every video person's tool set and arsenal. So you'll see here that there is actually a link to register for it uh, on Tuesday, August 22nd. It's at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I can't endorse this so much, uh, more. Please uh, sign up uh, and get educated on some audio plugins. Lastly, we invite you to get in touch with us. Uh, we want to hear about what projects you're working on. We want to hear um, what you thought of the webinar. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. Uh, you can either hit us up at keycodemedia.com where you'll see a, a plethora of information and products. Um, and you can also find us on virtually every social media network there is, including uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. If you go to YouTube, actually, we have a lot of videos on technology, including other videos on Avid Interplay that is uh, uh, custom. It's not the traditional marketing stuff you're accustomed to. This is down and dirty, uh, great information uh, for you uh, as well as your constituents. Uh, also, um, if you're watching this at keycodemedia.com, you'll see that there are a couple more tabs on the page. Uh, please click the one that says webinar survey. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, we're always trying to improve here. We're always trying to do things better. And with your input, we can certainly get better. So I'd like, you, like to thank you for attending. Uh, again, this is Michael Thomas with Key Code Media. Uh, thank you, Avid. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Matt McLean. Uh, and we invite you to get in touch with us. So until next time, thank you very much. I'm Matthew Straub, Technology Department Chair for Clark Magnet High School. With education, the idea is to train students to be prepared for industry. The whole idea of switching to network-based editing is to work in a fashion that is going to mirror what's being used. Avid ISIS succinctly fits in a world where multiple people can connect, work on the same project at the same time, and really learn how to work together and collaborate successfully. ISIS 5000 supports a far greater number of files and directories. You're leveraging industry standard Ethernet. You're not limited to very expensive fiber channel infrastructures. Now that we have the server, we could have four students working on one project. The amount of man hours that you can put into a one project during one class period has multiplied exponentially. We went with ISIS because of its cross-platform compatibility. Uh, we have legacy versions of Final Cut. We have legacy projects that we may need to touch later. Uh, and ISIS will work with Final Cut. ISIS will also work with Premiere. The ISIS 5000 is pretty much universal. Any application that runs on a Mac or PC can access these shared files. That includes encoding solutions, asset management solutions, audio solutions, and almost any kind of video editing solution out there. ISIS is very intuitive. The students were up and running in a matter of a class or two. I'd say it's probably easier to install an ISIS or upgrade an ISIS than it is to troubleshoot a Unity. The other great thing about it is the ability to set up workspaces and work groups. Everything can be very easily customized to fit a student's project or a group's project. We have better trained technicians, more experience to give you guys the best opportunity for a successful outcome. Our sales department, they're out there making sure that they're a partner with our clients, not just out there to sell them the next widget. Keycode has committed to our program. They've committed to our, our students and our community as, as a company. Keycode Media values the educational market. I really believe that educating children for the future is what's a difference maker for our planet. Avid did pass a visit, and it was a huge compliment. It's those kinds of partnerships that really make this stuff successful.